Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's doing okay today. Remember, we have our fourth test. Good. The more tests, the better. I always say it's nice to have more assessments because they count less and it gives you more opportunities to, to perfect your skills. Um, I always disliked the classes as an undergrad that, that had just a midterm and a final, and then some classes I took only had a final, and that, that tended to be a little stressful. So at least at San Jacinto College, we, we make an effort to give you enough assessments. Um, students still have an issue with that, but, but that's really preparing you for the university. Most, most university settings now will with, with STEM classes will give you at least maybe two opportunities during the term to be assessed and then have a final exam. So we're trying to pretty much mimic what you're going to see as you continue your education. So just remember uh, the same format for the uh, fourth test, same window of time, everything, all the rules, all the guidelines are the same. So by now everybody's a professional and, and I expect uh, you to be responsible in, in executing uh, the test and turning in your work. Uh, that makes everything easy. And then, then you're kind of springboarding into uh, our final exam. So what I'll do on Thursday is uh, if I don't complete everything today, I might uh, finish up a few items and then just go over some uh, review type items. Again, uh, that's merely to just remind you of what you have been doing. A lot of you I know uh, like to study on your own, but, but it's always nice just to see some review examples and get your mind geared uh, to the type of uh, topics that will be covered on the test. And just remember, uh, we will cover through the material last week as, as evidenced by the uh, Blackboard announcement. And again, I will stress, be sure to follow the instructions. Uh, if I ask you to do something on the test, then your test work should exhibit those uh, qualities. And I will, again, uh, don't look for just an answer. Do not work backwards from the answers. That is the worst thing you can do. And that is the best way to get no credit. So you work the problem like you don't even know what the answers are and you work it out. That way, that way, then you can assess the responses and say, okay, I'm, I need to make an adjustment here. I might have an error or whatever. So that part of it is actually a boost uh, to, to your work. But again, work your problems completely in numeric order so I can read them. Uh, the final exam will be exactly the same. So I appreciate your attendance to that, attention to that and your attendance, uh, whatever. Okay, so, um, what we want to do today is talk about sequences, the arithmetic, the geometric, and how they all combine together to, to basically give us an introduction to what you'll be doing in Cal 1 and Cal 2 when it comes to Riemann sums and infinite series. So you may have seen some of this before, but that doesn't matter. I'll just start at the beginning and we'll work through some ideas, basically some notation, just like we had with the trigonometry and the uh, conic sections. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen. Like I said, we have the new uh, IPVO software, which again, uh, you future computer engineers and you future computer scientists, often software must be adjusted uh, to make use of, of the great internet connections and the uh, powerful computers that we have these days. So if the software is not taking advantage of that, it doesn't run as smoothly. So IPVO updated the uh, format for uh, their document cam, and you can see it's really clear, just like it was before, but now the, it's smoother. So as, as I move and I talk, uh, it covers that in a very smooth, continuous way. So, so I like that. And, and this was a surprise last week. So we're, we're happy with this surprise. Now, what I wanted to do was start out with something you actually already know, but make it just a little bit more formal, but not a lot. When we talk about sequences, we're necessarily going to discuss sums or series. So I've kind of lumped this together. So what is a sequence? 
A real sequence f is a real value function defined on the natural numbers. Now that's a fancy way of saying that you just have an ordered list. You have a first element, you have a second element, you have a third element, et cetera. And in most cases, the list is infinite, okay? It can be truncated. So usually with the notation, what we do, instead of saying like f of n, where we've got the natural number, we'll just say a sub n. So n will be the input and a sub n will be the output. So we get two for the price of one. Now, when you notice this, sometimes this is called the nth term or the general term. So often when you look at a sequence, the first thing that comes to mind is that you're gonna try to figure out if possible a formula for the general term. Maybe, maybe one is possible, maybe one isn't, but you might be thinking that when there is a formula that's possible, that may create some more mathematics uh, that makes the problem more interesting. So for instance, what, what are some examples? For instance, we could think about a list of real numbers, which is just the natural numbers. For instance, we could say one, two, three, four, et cetera in, et cetera. So this is like a, an ordered list of the ordered list. The, the natural numbers is, is what we call a well-ordered set. There's always a least element in every subset, and that's a very important property. The real numbers clearly don't have that. So we, we want to be able to maximize that property. So for instance, if we just had the natural numbers as a sequence, we could just say that the nth term is just n, where n is a natural number. And remember, we use the boldface n for natural numbers, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So that's, that's an interesting sequence, but not very complicated. Now, in, in section one of chapter 12, you just get some uh, practice working with some of the notations of sequences and you, you, know, you fill in some values for n and get output, so it's really, quite simple, but, but it's important to uh, basically get uh, accustomed to using the notation and just getting, you know, kind of like doing uh, uh, algebraic structures that we did at the first of the course where you added polynomials and multiplied them, just getting back into that routine. Now, when you look at a sequence, there clearly are some calculus things going on that you're gonna talk about in calculus too, but what we like to do with sequences is add the terms. And that's where we create the series. That is, if we start adding terms of the sequence, we, we get what we call partial sums. And the reason I started with this is that this is a very famous, I call this a famous formula because it's partial sum is something you're going to use in this class and also in calculus one. So for instance, we add, the terms of a sequence to create partial sums. And I think it's nice to just start with a simple sequence and show how this is done. And then this introduces the notation of the sum. So for instance, and, and we say create partial sums, which in itself is a sequence, a new sequence. And you'll study this quite intently when you get to calculus two. So for instance, we'll say that the first partial sum, in this case, will just be one. So we can think of this as A1, A2, but I'm just gonna use the numbers here. The second partial sum will add the first two elements of the sequence, okay? So now what you're seeing is that we're creating a sequence from a sequence, a sequence of partial sums. And then of course the third partial sum will be one plus two plus three. And of course, let's write down a couple more. The fourth partial sum, one plus two plus three plus four. And then of course, if we wrote the nth partial sum, we would say one, plus two, plus three. And then of course we get lazy and do the ellipsis. 
ending with n. So this would be the sum of the first n terms. Now, all of this keeps going. This is what we call a sequence of partial sums. Now, when you think about this, oh, and I've got to move Professor Ron over. There we go. If I can always be sure to focus. Um, if you look at this, you're thinking, okay, you know, this, this will be something that you'll do quite often when you talk about series and convergence, but you could just keep going infinitely here. Now, what is, what is important about this is that from the partial sum, we develop a nice notation. So, so it might be good to write out what this actually means, but there's a notation that makes this much more compact. So what we can do is say Sn and use the Greek sigma, the uppercase, so-called the uh, capital sigma. And since we're already using n, we could say k equals one to n of k. So what this does is introduce a nice compact notation. We have the index k, when k is equal to one, we put the one here, and then we increase to the next index two, and then we have one plus two. So S2 is one plus two. S3, the three would be here, one plus two plus three. And then, of course, here we've mimicked the nth partial sum where we begin at k equal one for the index and then increase to n. So this would be a very convenient way to write this sum in more compact notation. So what we usually refer to as this variable here, we call this the index. And the index normally will start at one, but of course, life is not always that good to us. Sometimes the index will start at different numbers, maybe two or zero or whatever, and we will have to re-index sometimes. And we say, this is the beginning index and this is the upper index or the ending index. So we start with one and then we have plus two, plus three, and we keep going until we exhaust by ending with the upper index. So this notation, even though at first it's a little bit awkward, it is very useful and it allows us to create an algebra. Now, what's interesting about this particular partial sum is that the formula for this does exist and it exists for all powers of natural numbers, squares, cubes, fourth powers, fifth powers, that can be algorithmically generated. But this particular formula looks like this, n times n plus one over two. And this is what we call one of the famous formulas. And it can be proven easily algebraically, and it can also be proven by induction, which we're gonna talk about next week. So when you think about this type of construction, we're thinking when we start adding natural numbers like this, this may give us a convenient way to add a list of natural numbers. It certainly wouldn't be something that would exist at infinitum. So as n would get larger and larger and larger, this value would get bigger also. And so we would not expect this particular sum to converge at infinity. That means that if the values keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're adding larger and larger numbers, there's no way that this uh, sum could converge. And that will, that will be something we'll talk about today and also something you'll spend a good couple of weeks on <laughs> in calculus too. So here's, here's one of the famous formulas here. While we're at it, I wanna go ahead and state two more. There's nothing sacred about just the first powers, why don't we square them? So we're gonna think of another partial sum. I'm not gonna give it a name, I'm just gonna write it down here. We'll say K equals one to N. And we, we think about the squares. So again, I'll write out a few of the terms, one squared plus two squared plus three squared ending with n squared. So the idea here is whatever expression we have here, this is basically what operations we apply to the indices. So when n k is one, we do one squared. Then we have plus, 
then k is two, we have two squared. So here we're not doing anything but just adding the numbers. Here we're adding the squares. So we say this is the sum of squares of the first n natural numbers. Now, again, this has a very interesting formula. n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. This can be proven algebraically or it can be proven by induction. And we will we will learn about induction. For now, these are good are good formulas to to uh, to learn uh, and put on note cards because when you take calculus one and you do Riemann sums, you will use these in your computations, and they'll be they'll be the linchpin that gets you from the initial setup to the to the uh, finish line. Okay, so again, if we add the first n natural numbers we have a partial sum formula. And again, this is a luxury. Usually we don't, it's not often the case that we can get a really nice formula for a partial sum. And when we can, we're, we're, we're happy about that. Now, another one, again, we could just keep going, but the, the last one that I wanna talk about would be, okay, let's just go ahead and extend this to the cubes. Cause this would be another form that you would find some use of in calculus uh, one. So we could think of adding the cubes. So we'll say one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed, et cetera, ending with n cubed. Now, again, this has a nice compact formula. Again, another luxury, and it happens to be the square of this one. So it's n squared times n plus one squared over four. Now you're thinking if we have some properties for sums, algebraic properties, it may turn out that these famous formulas could be extremely useful to us and they will be. So, so again, sequences are fine, but we get the most at least output when we think of manipulating them by adding in, in a very systematic way the terms of the sequence. We, we don't wanna be haphazard, even though that's something you can talk about in calculus. We wanna do it very systematically, where we add the terms in a precise order, starting with the first, second, third, going in that direction, okay? So, so this is a very systematic way of adding terms of a sequence. Now, there are all kinds of sequences. And I want to mention a couple more, but before I do that, since I've gone ahead and talked about the sums, I wanna give you some properties of sums. So here are some properties of sums. Now, when we refer to a sequence, you know, in math, we like to be nice and efficient and, and lazy. So we might say, in this case that we refer to the general term. We'll say a sub n, I'll just do an and here, a sub n and b sub n are sequences. So the idea is that we refer to the nth term. So this would, this would be, you know, a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, et cetera that sequence, and this one would be b sub one, b sub two, b sub three, et cetera, that sequence. So an ordered list. So instead of saying, okay, we've got this function and then we're gonna you know, write all this down, we just refer to the sequence by its representation of the general term. Like we'll just say the function f we'll say the sequence or the function a sub n. And, that, and, and we, would, we would basically, by writing this, assume that these functions or these sequences were different. Like we say function g and function h, by giving them different uh, labels, we, we make the assumption that they're different functions. They could be the same, but the, the tacit assumption is that they're different. Okay, so we've got two sequences and fix a real number c. 
So what we want to do here is say, if, we, if we've got sums, do they have nice algebraic properties like we have for the algebra of sums? And, we, and they do, they do exist. So let me write some of these down. They're very simple. So what we want to think about is creating new sequences. Let's take the number C and let's just say that we multiply each of these sequence terms by C to create a new sequence. Say C is two, so we just multiply all the terms of the sequence by two. So we might think, okay, what is that gonna mean? We'll say K equals one to N of C times A sub K. Well, you would think since C is a constant that we could actually factor that and then add the terms of the sequence as we normally do. And that's exactly the case. You can factor the C and do the partial sum like I've already defined. So here's, here's a nice property that says, if you've got a generating term here, an nth term or a kth term, and you're multiplying it by a constant, well, you can factor that constant since the constant has no dependence on the uh, index. So this is a common procedure that helps you to simplify sums. Okay, so, so we might say the new sequence or new sequences will have C A sub N. Now, of course, since I'm using a partial sum here, the, the, the largest index is N, I have to use a different variable here. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. N equals one to N. So that's a little bit unclear. So I just use another letter like K. You could use I, you could use J. Those tend to be popular letters for indices. Now you're thinking, okay, so we create a new sequence by multiplying one sequence by a constant. Let's look at creating a new sequence by just adding two sequences, something like this. Again, in all cases, n is a natural number. So the, the next first term of this sequence would be a sub one plus b sub one. The second term would be a sub two, b sub two, et cetera. So you're thinking, what would happen if we had to do a partial sum for this new sequence? And it's probably exactly what you think, a sub k plus b sub k. Well, again, Finite sums always converge. So you might be thinking, we'll do something similar to what we've done up here. We can just break up this sum into two pieces and add each of the sequences separately. So we'd say K equals one to N of A sub K plus K equals one to N of B sub K. So again, this basically takes the fact that all we're doing is adding these terms and then just by using basic properties of real numbers, we can redistribute, reassociate, and then break it up into two pieces. So this, this shorthand notation for the partial sum is very useful because now we can manipulate it to, to move the problem forward in a very efficient way. And so, of course, nothing sacred about this. We weren't gonna look, we're not going to look at products. Those are a little bit more complicated. That'll come later as you get more advanced. But of course, the difference of two elements, for instance, if we take the difference of these two sequences, so a sub 1 minus b sub 1, can we do the same thing? Absolutely. So let's do another new sequence and do its partial sum. k equals 1 to n a sub k minus b sub k. So then we look at this and say, well, this will be the same property, but we'll switch the plus to a minus. Again, just using properties of real numbers. So now you're thinking if we had to do a finite sum we could possibly use some of the famous formulas in conjunction with these nice properties. So, so again, not, not even difficult, but with the new notation, you, you're thinking, okay, these are functions. Okay, so we can add functions. You're thinking when you add two functions, you can break them a piece apart point-wise, subtracting, adding, same thing. 
of course, now with the sums, the, the products and all that are a little bit more complicated. And you're going to talk about that when you do power series and calculus too, and even division. That will be polynomial multiplication and long division when you get to power series. So we'll hold off on that uh, when you're a little bit more advanced. Now, one thing that, that is very useful that, that will come up in the mix is to say, what if, we, what if we have something so simple, but we look at it and think, what do we do with it? So say we take this C here and put that as the nth term, so to speak. We know the first thing we can do is factor this because it has no impact on the, uh, the K has no impact on it. So we're, we're leaving behind a one, so to speak. So we'd have something like this. So I'm doing a mini proof with this. We're getting one here. So, so the idea is when you have the sum of one from k equal one to n, you're basically adding one to itself n times. So, so this is when you've got the property of the c here, the result will just be nc as long as you're starting at one. And this is important. When you do this problem, uh, there, are, there are n indices here. So you will add one to itself n times, and then n times c is just nc. So even though this is very simple, it's very useful. It may very well be the case that you, you, know, you turn up with this, like for instance, here's an example of this. Say we have k equals one to 10 of two. Well, again, we're starting at one and we're ending at 10. So this would just be two times 10 or 20 because we're adding two to itself 10 times. So the, the fact is, is that two and K, no, no connection, but we still have to add. So, so each time you iterate the index, you add a two. The next time you, iterate, you add a two. So this gives you a very quick way to get an answer without any work. So again, you can always factor constants, which basically is what I'm doing here. So I probably could have said something about this up here. But once we get to here, now this seems a little bit more uh, accessible. We can always add sequences to make new sequences and the partial sums is just the, adding the separate partial sums. We can make new sequences by taking differences, A1 minus B1, A2 minus B2, create a list that way. And we can do partial sums by just taking the difference of the separate partial sums. So this partial sum idea is actually very nice because it sets up a very clean algebra that we can use. Okay, so when it comes to actually working with expressions, you're thinking, well, let's just see how this works. Let's, let's try an example where we do a partial sum and we use these properties. Okay, now, of course, you're thinking, well, Professor Ron, I can just write down all the terms and just add them up. <laughs> and you know, there is nothing wrong with that. That is, that is fine, but I wanna give you some techniques to use so that you can actually do this efficiently. And then, of course, if, you know, maybe maybe the upper index turns out to be a fairly large number and, and it's really kind of hard to keep up with all those terms, th these, these procedures may make your work much easier. So here's an example where we can use our new uh, properties of sums and the famous formulas. So I'm going to say compute the sum. And I'm going to show you how to re-index too. So we, I'm going to use I this time. I is a very useful index letter. So we'll use I. That's used a lot in calculus. I equals 3 to 12. And we have 2I squared plus 3. Now, I made this one a little bit more complicated, not because the difficulty is what's important, but I want to show you that if we use the famous formulas, we have to start our index at one. And so our, if, if you recall, the famous formulas all start with the index one here. 
Okay, I'll start with index one. So I intentionally wrote this to start at index three. So let me show you a strategy of re-indexing. So our, and of course, in this case, I'm gonna make it a little bit harder. I'm gonna put a square there. I, I don't wanna make it too simple. So it's two I squared. So the I is squared. Let me write that so it's easy to see. That way it's clear that I'm squaring the I plus three. That's a little bit clearer. So to re-index, so we want to start at one. So we're gonna say, we're gonna say start at one. So basically what this means is that we have to subtract two from this, but if we subtract two from this, we have to add two here to compensate for it. So, so basically this is the scheme So this will give us the sum. Okay, we're gonna subtract two here and subtract two here. I equals one to 10. And then now the I must be incremented by two here. Two times I plus two quantity squared plus three. Now let's just see that this works. When I equals three here, notice we have uh, I squared, that's nine. Nine times two is 18, plus three is 21. Now here, when I is equal to one, we have the same thing. We get one plus three, so that's a nine, times a two, which is an 18, plus three equals 21. So these, these are correlated to be equivalent. So, so now it, it, it's very nice here that we have our sums beginning at one, as opposed to three, because if we want to use the famous formulas without having to re-index all of them, it's so much more easy to do this. And then we just kind of cast the famous formulas into the problem with a lot less uh, difficulty. So re-indexing is something that we will do and something you'll do in calculus all the time. So it's nice to see that it's just very common sense approach, nothing, nothing complicated at all. Now, what I'm gonna do is expand this and then we're gonna clean it up and use the famous formulas just so we can practice. Now, again, there are many ways to do this problem, but I'm gonna do it so it exhibits all of the nice uh, properties that we've derived. So this will be I equals one to 10. And so now go ahead and expand the square. So we have two I squared plus Okay, two I, so that's gonna give us a four I plus a four. And then we have plus a three here. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking here, this is just gonna be a matter of extracting a two in this particular case. Now, the idea is if we break up each of these into nice sums, we can operate them on, on them separately with the famous formulas. So now let's just see what we have. Let's go ahead and break this up. So we're gonna have the first sum, we have two I squared, I equals one to 10. And next we'll have two times four, so this is I equals one to 10 of eight I. Okay, remember two times four, and now we have two times four, just adding eight to itself, plus I equals one to 10, two times four, that's eight. And then the one way out here, you know, I didn't, re I didn't reduce this, so I'll just go ahead and write it out. This will just be adding three to itself 10 times. So basically what I did here, ladies and gentlemen, is I just broke all of this up into four pieces. Notice the I squared is a famous formula that we know. The I is a famous formula that we know, adding the first in natural numbers. And then these are just adding uh, numbers to itself, in these cases, 10 times, which is using this property here, right here. So we're breaking it up using uh, one, two, and three. 
and then we're going to use four now. So again, all these constants can be factored. So we get two times the sum i equals one to 10 of i squared. This is what you'll be doing in calculus. It's, it's important to learn how to do it. And if you don't see it until calculus, you won't be able to do it. So we factor the a and the two, leaving the i squared and the i. And now of course we can just bring these out. So plus, now you're thinking this is just adding eight to itself 10 times. So we have eight times 10. This is adding three to itself 10 times. So this is just three times 10. So that was the easy part. Again, no dependence on i. So each time we increment the index, we add an eight. So we add eight, 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 10 times. We add three, 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 et cetera, 10 times to get these. Now we can use our famous formulas. So we have two. So for the square, remember, we have n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. And this is where n equals 10. So we'll just put our little value for 10. So I wrote the formula and n will be evaluated at 10 right here. 10. Sometimes you can do a vertical line. I just put this in a box so you won't miss it. Then we have plus eight. We're going to use our famous formula. This will be n times n plus one over two. And then of course, evaluate it at n equal 10. Usually you can write a vertical line, but it'll just be easy to do that. So this formula will be evaluated at 10. I didn't want to go ahead and substitute it because then you wouldn't be able to see the formula. So this way you can see the formula and the value that we have to substitute for n. And then of course here we have plus 80 plus 30, okay? So now we can go ahead and substitute. Notice two over three, uh, two over six, the two absorbs into the six to give us a one third. So we have one third. And then we can substitute 10 in for n. So 10, 11, and then two times 10 plus one, 21. Okay. So that's very straightforward using the famous formula. Of course, now the two absorbs into the eight to give us a four. And then we can substitute the value of 10 for n, 10 times 11. And then lastly, of course, here we just get 110. So now you can see that you could have just substitute all these numbers and add it up, but if that were maybe a, a 50, this would still work and it'd be much easier. It's easier to, to do it in a systematic way than to try to keep track of that many uh, elements to add. But again, this, this is how you actually navigate a Riemann sum and taking a limit to provide a, a uh, the definition of the Riemann integral. And this algebra is important. And without the algebra, you don't get to the finish line. So, so even though you think, well, I could, I could just use my fancy calculator and of course, and learn absolutely nothing. So, so again, the key in doing STEM mathematics is understanding it and being able to work it out. So when you get to Cal 1, you can navigate the waters, so to speak. So now let's just go ahead and finish. The three will absorb into the uh, 21. So here we get 10 times 11 times a seven plus, now we've got a four times a 10 times an 11 plus a 110. So we got nice numbers here. So this is what, this is a 77, 10 times a 77 and 10 times a 44. And then that's just 10 times 11, right? But I'll just write it that way. So this gives us 770 plus 440 plus 110. So we can easily add these up. So zero, so we get an 11. So we get a 12 and 110. 
So that'll give us a what? 1310 plus a 10 or 1320. So the, what, I, what I wanted to do here is kind of give you an example that covers all the bases. When you need to do finite sums, and these will come up very often, the famous formulas allow you, they give you those partial sum formulas that, so, that, that are convenient for the, the sum of the first 10 squares of the natural numbers, the sum of the first n natural numbers here to give you these simple partial sum formulas. These are a luxury. Partial sum formulas are usually hard to come by. And so we're glad when we can use them. And then of course, these are the simple ones using just the nature of the, uh, the sum. So, so when you work on a particular finite sum which says compute the sum, you can always break it down and use the properties of the sum, just like you're thinking about these like functions. So we apply the algebra. Re remember the first thing was to re-index so that we can use the famous formulas directly. The, the idea is that if you make, if you repair this early on, then you get something that allows you to utilize your formulas without having to do additional work. And I think that's worth it. So re-indexing is something that you will often do. And especially when you all get to uh, differential equations, calculus two re-indexing and differential equations, when you solve uh, differential equations uh, using power series, you will often have to re-index. So it's a, good, it's a good way to start now to build the foundation as you, uh, get into these more uh, uh, advanced courses. And they're only more advanced because you know more. It's not, it's not like you know, you're not ready for it now. You will be ready for it. We're just preparing you for it. So when it comes to the idea of doing partial sums, we like, we like the fact that we can navigate this in a very systematic way. All right, just like we're doing trig equations or just like we're doing uh, conic sections. Now, what I want to do is look at some very famous sequences. Now, they're, they're, they're telescoping sequences, they're arithmetic sequences and geometric sequences that are actually really kind of nifty. So the first one I want to do, we'll talk about telescoping with the geometric, but uh, I want to talk about the arithmetic, arithmetic sequence. These are, these are famous sequences like the famous formulas. So you, you have dealt with arithmetic sequences pretty much all of your life. I mean, you, you've been working with them, but you didn't know they were arithmetic. You, you were taking a standardized test and figured out the pattern that, that all of the terms differed by given uh, a constant. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to say we're going to fix A and D as real numbers. And for right now, just to just to be interesting, uh, not necessarily. Um, we'll we'll usually have a, a case where the A and the D are non-zero. A could be zero, but right now we'll just say that A is non-zero and D is non-zero. Uh, of course. Uh, the A could be zero, but right now let's just look at something that has some content to it. So we're fixing these real numbers. So what we're going to do uh, for the first term, usually when we write the first term of a sequence, we call it A sub one. But we're, in this case, we're just going to call it A for now. The first term is going to be A. So for instance, we'll say A sub one is A. And that's a standard notation, and it actually turns out to be very useful, and you will thank me for it. Okay, and then we're going to call the common difference the D. The common difference will be D. Okay, so the first term is going to be A. It's going to be the same notation with the geometric sequence, and this is, this is very standard. Okay, just like the standard uh, qualities of the uh, trigonometric uh, ideas that we just spent a long time doing and, and the conic sections, which the you know, conic sections, there's so, there's so much convention there. It's like, you, you feel like you're already an engineer. 
So now, when what, what does the sequence look like? So here's the sequence. We have the first term, and then we get to the second term by adding the D. The D could be positive or negative, it doesn't matter. And then we add another copy. So when you look at this, you, as you move from the first to the second one, you see a difference by D. You move from second to third, a difference by D. So as we move to each successive term, we're adding D. So we see successive terms differ by this number. That's why we call it the common difference, okay? So A plus 3D. So if you keep going, the nth term will be that we've added N minus one copies of D. So A plus N minus one copies of D, et cetera. So for the general term, we just say A sub N equals A. Again, this is just common sense that we don't have to prove this. I mean, this is what's going on right here. So we will say n is greater than or equal to one. So of course, when n is equal to one, we get the first term is a, the second term will be what? a plus d, et cetera. So this is what we call our general or nth term, general or nth term. Again, you can make up any sequence you like. A sequence can have any form you want it to have. If you're trying to solve a problem, you come up with a sequence that gets the job done. It's like defining a function because this is a function. Now, so, so you're thinking, right, you, you've taken your standardized test where you figured out that the sequence was arithmetic. And then they said, okay, figure out the fifth term or whatever. So when we think about the geometric sequence, we see that we need to know A and D. If we know A and D, then we're fine. We can move forward or Maybe we're given enough information of the elements and to, to figure out the first element and figure out the, uh, you know, the common difference. As long as we're given enough information so we can determine A and D, we understand the arithmetic sequence. Now, what have we been doing? We've been doing partial sums. So let's write the partial sum. So as I, as I started off the lecture, I was big on the sum. So uh, let's derive a formula and we can do it. I'm not, I'm not asking you to do something that we can't do. Let's derive a formula for the partial sum. Like I said before, partial sum formulas are, are the exception. But in these famous sequences, we have partial sum formulas. So let's do it. So S sub n, and we get to use one of our famous formulas. That's why I went ahead and introduced them. So of course, for the nth partial sum, say we want to add n terms of the arithmetic sequence. So this will be k equals one to n. And here's our general term here, but since we're already using n here, we'll switch that to a k. A plus k minus one times d. So this is why I showed you how to use the properties for the sum already. There is a method to madness. And if you're gonna learn mathematics, there has to be some type of systematic execution. Otherwise your, your learning is not synthesized. I'm big on synthesis. If you cannot synthesize ideas, you cannot do STEM, okay? So just remember that there always has to be a method. And, and if you take the time to organize when you write your test work, that's gonna be good. That's gonna make you better. So now you look at this and say, well, this is just a bunch of stuff, Professor Ron. We can just break it up. Here's one piece, here's a second piece. D and A are constants, so we're good to go. So let's break it up. So we have K equals one to N. So we're gonna add A to itself N times. So that's pretty simple, then plus, K equals one to N. And now we have what? D, I'll just flip it around times K minus one. So it's kind of like we've got a famous formula here, but we're stopping at K minus one. So we can make a nice uh, adjustment to the famous formula uh, to get the answer that we need without any difficulty. Cause this is starting at one, which is fine. So now 
we add a to itself n times. So this is n times a. And now, of course, the d is a constant, so it can be factored. Now, like I said before, when we look at this, this is adding the first natural numbers, but we, we, we start with one, but we end with n minus one, we, because here we're subtracting one. So you're thinking, could we do the famous formula and then just subtract one and do it that way? Absolutely, but that's, that's too difficult. We, we, can, we, can, we can focus here. So now what we're seeing is we're only ascending to n minus one and not to n, so we can make an adjustment in our formula to keep this much more easily executed. So this is Na plus D, and now we're only ascending to uh, N minus one. So we get N minus one times N divided by two. Again, we're, this is K minus one, so the largest integer that we have is n minus one. So again, n is replaced with n minus one. So n becomes n minus one and n plus one becomes n. So that's the adjustment we need, but hardly a difficult adjustment. So here was the famous formula, famous formula. Okay, now we can just do some algebra. Of course, of course, you know, the convention people came in and said, well, you know, we need to, we need to change this up a little bit. So we got n over two and we have d times n minus one. So you're thinking, Professor Ron, we're done. There we have it. That's a formula right there. If I know what n is, I know what a and d, done. I can, I can fill in those numbers and I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Now, this is not how the formula looks in the, in the standard literature. And here's what, here's what happens. To make this look more user-friendly so we can actually derive a, even another formula is to factor the n over two out of both of these. That has become convention, kind of like with the conic sections. So we do n over two. And of course here, we've got to pay for this two downstairs. We've factored the n, but we've got a two a to pay for the two there, but this one we already have. So this is plus what D times N minus one. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, is that better? This is convention right here. When you think about this particular one, when you, when you look at it this way, this is the standard formula for the partial sum of an arithmetic uh, sequence. And you're thinking, well, that doesn't look much better than that. And I agree, but there is some simplicity by factoring the n over two. And of course we have no fractions in here. So this is a standard formula for the partial sum of the arithmetic sequence right there. And then you're thinking, okay, well, 2a, d, n minus one, whatever. Now, so, so you're thinking, can we do something with this? And we can. We can rewrite the a, 2a is a plus a. So here's an, another form that you will see. You'll see n over two. I'll use this one many times because it's convenient. So we'll write the 2a is a plus, and now we'll move an a over here and write a plus, and I'll put the n minus one first so it looks like that, n minus one times d. But now what you're seeing is that this is exactly the nth term. So you can write this as n over two times the first term plus the nth term. Now here's another form that's popular but again, it just depends on what you're given in a problem. So you can move the two over here and say you're averaging the first term and the nth term and multiplying by n. So this is another form. And if it's convenient to use it, you can, but you know, it just really depends what's given in the problem and, and what you choose to use. Again, that's a personal choice. So 
when it comes to the arithmetic sum, what we see is we have two forms for the partial sum, which is better than just adding it up, okay? So the first one, again, has this form, the n over two is common to both, and you've got the 2a plus d times the n minus one. And here, you just rig this to emulate the uh, nth term here, so you get a plus a sub n, basically the average of the first and the uh, last term or nth term multiplied by n. So I always tell students, use whichever one you like, but put both of them on the note card. Okay, so, so what we're seeing is that this, this sequence is famous enough that we talk about it and it does occur in, in life quite often. So you, we need to know something about it. But the problem with this, and, and we can see, um, you're adding D here, this, this number, and it never changes, okay? It never changes. It's not getting smaller, like converging to zero or something, that, which would be very convenient, but you could see in the infinite case, this would not converge. That this, you, if, you, if you add up an infinite number of terms, you're gonna get an infinite sum. And so, but, but you're thinking if you add a billion terms, you, get, you still get a finite number, it just has a billion terms in it. But we often wanna think what would happen if we just got crazy and let n pass to infinity? Would we actually converge? And in this case, we don't get convergence. So this is kind of like the famous formulas. It's only good in the finite case, but, but we'll take it. You know, we're, beggars can't be choosy, right? Okay, so let's apply this. So when it comes to arithmetic, there's some real simple examples that have to do with everyday life. And so let's look at one. Here's an example. So let's recall, remember, let's just do a little sidebar here. When we have our arithmetic, what do we have? We have n over two, we have two a plus n minus one times a d. That is the formula right here that we just derived, okay? So in this case, we've got the following. Okay, so a salesperson, I'll just write this, a salesperson is offered a starting salary of 30,000 per year. 30,000 per year for each subsequent year, for each subsequent year, the salesperson receives, in this case, a $2,000 bonus. I'll put little dollar signs there so you know, $2,000 bonus or raise. So we, you get hired and then as you look at the subsequent years, you get that extra bonus or raise, 2,000. So here's an example, here's, here's, here's something we can do. Here's a question that would make sense. Maybe, maybe you have a new job and they give you this information and you wanna figure out how much money are you gonna make in 10 years? So we'll say, how much money How much money is earned after 10 years? So, you know, your friends say, well, how much money is that gonna be in 10 years? You work 10 years, how much, how much money will you have made? And, you know, of course, before taxes and all, but, you know, that's fine. You know, it, the, the idea here is that arithmetic sequences are part of our life. So, so what we wanna do here is frame this as arithmetic. It's set up that way. So in your notes, just say frame as arithmetic. And of course you wouldn't, this wouldn't be infinite anyway. So just the fact that this doesn't converge in the infinite case is not horrible. It's just that we really wouldn't need it. So, if we want to think about the salary as being the, the uh, components or the, uh, what do we want to say this, 
when, when you talk about a sequence, you have the terms and we want the terms to represent the salary that he's making each year. So in this case, we're gonna say A, the first term will be $30,000. That'll be the amount of money he makes the first year. Then, and then of course D is gonna be the common difference because for each subsequent year, he's going to make an additional $2,000. So that's the, that's the bonus right there. So when you think about this, this is all set up. And then of course, after 10 years, N equals 10. So this is framed as arithmetic. You see? And then of course, A2 would be 30,000 plus 2,000. And we would do that for 10 years. So the key here is that, of course, you can write it all down and add it up, but let's, you know, maybe, maybe you're going to work for 20 years. I mean, or you write a little computer program to do this. Well, your computer program would have the arithmetic sequence in it, so you'd need to know how to work with it. So now this implies money earned, money earned after 10 years is just the 10th partial sum. And there we have it right there. So let's fill it in. So, so the key here is to frame as arithmetic and to set it up in a way that it mimics what you're given in the hypothesis, okay? So now we have N, so we have 10. Let's just fill it in over two. That's why I like to write the formula down so you can see what we're filling in. And then we have two times 30,000. And then we have plus, we have n minus one, which is nine times D, which is 2000. Okay, so now when you look at this, of course, that's a five, but we can rig this a little bit. Notice we've got a 2000 in, in both of these. So we're gonna, we're just gonna say, okay, in this particular case, when you, when you, take some stuff away, we're gonna be left here with a 30. So we have 2000. So take two, three of the zeros away times 30. Plus, I'll write this in this order, 2000 times nine, just to make the algebra easier. And then of course we can factor uh, the 2000. So we have five times 2000. And that leaves us with a 30 plus a nine. So of course now these numbers are really easy. That just gives us a 10 with three zeros. So we have 10,000 times a 39. So we tack on the 39 and the uh, four zeros. So after 10 years, you've made $390,000. Now, the key here is, is not that you can't just write all of this down and add it up. That's fine. But say you've got to do this for you know 200 employees. Say you work in human resources and you're sending out a bunch of letters to prospective employees and you're giving them salaries for disparate years all and you know just giving them something to think about well you need you need an arithmetic sequence you need a nice program to do this and so of course you'll go to IT and say I want you to write a program that's going to figure out these salaries for me so they get busy and say maybe you're working in the department so you write the 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 code and then you send it to the person in HR and it util, utilizes this mathematics so again, that, that's why uh, computer engineers, well, computer engineers, they actually build things. So they know, need to know the circuitry too, but they've got to know the mathematics. But the computer scientists, they are just, you know, washed in the mathematics because they do all the coding all the time. 
Okay. And I've got, I had students last semester that, that said, I can't wait to code. I can't just wait to solve problems with the coding. I said, well, make sure you get your math. And so they were just kind of reborn with the math. They said, I'm going to do the math in a systematic way. So, so again, think of this like the last problem. We have framed this as arithmetic, and now we have a very uh, systematic way to, to evaluate it. And then, of course, you can go in and change the numbers and change all of this and still have an algorithm to solve it. So I think this is kind of neat. Again, doesn't converge in the infinite case, but it's very useful. So good for us. Now, there are some other examples uh, that you'll see with arithmetic that will be really fun. So take the advantage of knowing the partial sum, fill it in. Sometimes you have to work backwards. You're given, you're given the uh, partial sum and you have to find the end. So you end up with a quadratic equation and you solve the quadratic just like you did it in college algebra. So, so there's all kinds of neat little problems that you can do with, with arithmetic. So don't, don't be afraid of them. Just welcome them as really something very simple uh, with the partial sums. Now, the arithmetic is, is popular, but the next sequence geometric is probably the most important sequence that you will study in calculus. Uh, it is the linchpin of infinite series and power series when you take calculus to uh, you will see it in physics and engineering. The geometric series is kind of like the Pythagorean theorem. If we didn't have it, we would struggle. We would really struggle. So this, this sequence uh, you will see here and evermore, geometric sequence. I remember I may have already said this, asking a visiting professor from when I was in grad school, she was in uh, complex analysis. I said, what would we do without the geometric? She said, well, probably work a lot harder. I said, well, let's not think about that. I'll, I'll, I'll just forget that I asked that question. But she laughed and said, yeah, it is, it is a linchpin. So in this particular case, we're gonna characterize a different kind of sequence with the similar notation, but with one change. We're not, in this case, we're not gonna have what we call a common difference. It's gonna be a common ratio. So what we're gonna do is fix A and R as real numbers. Now, again, just to be a fuddy-duddy, you know, let's just assume that A and R are non-zero just to make the problem interesting. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make much sense to us. So we're gonna say A and R are non-zero. Zero is a terrific number, but here we want some content. Now, what we're gonna do in this particular case is form a sequence just like we did last time. We're gonna say A, will denote the first term, just like we did before, first term. So basically, a sub one is a. Again, this is, this is a common notation. It's not set up to be difficult. It just makes the formulas. You think about the formulas that we've done, ladies and gentlemen, here. Makes the formulas look so much nicer. Why do you want to put extra stuff in there that would be confusing? You see what I'm saying? So this is standard and it actually makes the formulas look better, all right? So now we'll have R. This is gonna be called, and of course this has to be non-zero, this is gonna be called the common ratio. Common ratio, as opposed to common difference. Now here's the sequence. Like arithmetic, the first term is A. And now to get to the second term, instead of adding R, we will multiply by R. So we have AR. So now if I take the ratio of AR and A, I get R, the common ratio, you see? So if you look at successive terms in ratio, the result is what? R, A2 over A1, R, A5 over A4, R. So of course, to move to the next, we multiply by R, so we get two copies. So you're thinking this looks just like arithmetic instead of adding the copies, we're, we're multiplying. So now, as you move up to the nth term, you're gonna multiply by N minus one copies of R. Here's the first term, here's the nth term, et cetera. So we say A sub N is A, R to the N minus one. This is our general term or nth term. 
general or nth term. In, 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 that, in calculus two, we often say the nth term when we're, when we're writing this series, we say the nth term uh, or the generalized term or the generating sequence. I think Dr. Larson uses nth term because it just takes less energy to say, which is fine. So now, just like we had before, if you're given enough information, just like with arithmetic, so that you can determine the A and the R, then you understand this sequence, okay? If you have the A and the R or some means of actually determining that, then you have the geometric sequence that you can write. So again, what's nice, at least, at least at this point, is that we do have a way to get the general term. That's what I was saying at the beginning of the lecture. If, if, a, if a sequence like, like a random number generator, that's something a combinatorial uh, object, a function that generates random numbers, okay? That in and of itself is nothing that you can pin down. Okay, so that, that's a sequence that, that, okay, we need it, we need it, but it wouldn't be something that, okay, here's a formula for it. There's a certain combinatorial way to produce random numbers in a probabilistic way. But when we look at these types of sequences, there is enough order about the way the sequence is described that we can actually write a formula. And we can also write what we call recursive where the third term depends on the previous term. The, the fifth term depends on the previous two terms or whatever. We, we can also do recursive sequences and you'll see that as you work through the homework. So when we look at this, there's enough organization here that we have a nice way to generate any element of the sequence that we would like, okay? Now, of course, uh, we derive and this is where we're gonna talk about telescoping. We derive a formula for the partial sum. And of course, we'll call it S sub N. Now, you can think about your favorite uh, uh, geometric sequences where R is one half. You start with one, you know, one, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one over 32, one over 64. You're thinking, yeah, that's a really interesting sequence because those elements are getting closer and closer and closer to zero. And you're thinking, hmm, this might be a situation where we actually do get some convergence in an infinite case if we have certain restrictions in play. And we'll talk about that. So this this sequence has a higher level of importance because for certain values of R, it converges in the infinite case. So that is why it has so much importance in mathematics. It exists in the finite level clearly and also in the infinite level uh, with certain restrictions. So how can we do this? So let's just first note the following. S sub N will just be what? We'll use K now, of course, because we don't want to overuse N. K equals one to N, A, R to the K minus one. So when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, we don't really have much to work with in terms of like, remember with the last, with the arithmetic, we had a sum that we could break up and use the famous formula. Well, we don't have that luxury here, but we do have the fact that if we rig this, we can get most of the terms to absorb. That's what we call telescoping. And if they both, most of them just cease to exist, they all you know, converge to zero and we're just left with a couple of terms. We're like, boom, that's what we want. So how can we rig that? Well, here's a very simple way to do it. We'll say, consider S sub N minus R times S sub N. That is consider this sum, and we want to what, what I just said, create a telescoping sum. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at a linear combination, so to speak. 
we're going to take the partial sum here, and then we're going to multiply the partial sum by the common ratio, which is a constant which we can move inside. But notice, notice from the very object that I have written here, it factors. So I'm going to write that down first. This is just S of N times one minus R. So whatever we're doing right now, it appears that R equal one is not going to be something that will work with this formula. But if R is one, who cares anyway? It's all just A, 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 right? So that already imposes a restriction if we're going to consider this. So just an aside. So this is true, but now we have a formula for S sub n, which now we're going to manipulate. So let's write it down. So we have the partial sum and we're going to re-index and I've already taught you how to do that. So we're going to do it again. But now notice when we subtract here, we're going to multiply by R, which we can just move inside instead of K minus one, we'll have R to the K. So we have A R to the K. So that's why I gave you the properties of the sums so that we can now move the constant inside and then multiply and use the laws of exponents. Now, when you look at these two sums here, you're thinking, Something, something's not going to work very well, Professor Ron, because these terms are not like. The A is fine. The A is on our side. However, the, the fact that the powers are different, it's like saying x squared minus x cubed. That's as simple as you can get. You could factor it, but you can't combine it in a way that you get one term, right? Because they're different terms. So what we're going to do is we're going to re-index. We want to make sure that in this particular case, we get sums that are aligned, so to speak. So what I want to do, and this, and this is completely arbitrary, there's nothing unique about this. I want to make this, convert this into a K, so now these terms will be like, and then pay for it. So write this down. So K, this is going in the opposite direction. Instead of changing the index, we're now gonna change this and then change the index last. So K will become, all right, let me put the minus one. K minus one will become K. So that's gonna be our strategy. So that now these will be aligned. So if K becomes K minus one, we're adding one here. So we're gonna have to subtract one here to compensate for the incrementing of one in the nth term. So let's do it. So we'll get K equals zero to n minus one, just like we did before, but in the opposite order, right? And now we get a r k. So now when k is one, we just get a. When k is zero, we just get a, because r to the zero is by definition one. So that works. Not very fancy, but it works. Now minus this sum, which we're leaving alone. So this technique of re-indexing, ladies and gentlemen, is of extreme importance, but it basically just relies upon your common sense. It's not, not some major theorem. It, it, and uh, when I teach differential equations, I, the students are always like, well, I don't, what are you doing? I'm like, okay, we're just going to add one here, so we're going to subtract one here to compensate. It's kind of like completing the square. If you're going to add a magic number, you have to subtract it. Otherwise, you've changed the expression. So we're simply making adjustment here and countering it here so it gets us where we want to go. So now notice we've got a zero term here and we've got an n term here. The zero term is not here and the n term is not here. So let's pull those away as extra. So now for the k equals zero term, let's just say k equals zero. That's just going to be a. And then we'll start at one. This is where we see the telescoping at play now. And now, of course, here we're going to have a k equal n term that we don't have here. So first, we're going to write down the terms that we're going to leave in the sum, k equal 1 to n minus 1, a r k, and then we'll have k equal n right out here with a minus. So when k is equal to n, we get a r to the n. 
right there. But now this is what I was telling you. These are the same object. This is the absorb part. This is the telescoping part. Look at all these terms in the partial sum that go away. And you're thinking, well, boy, that's a strange way to get a partial sum formula, but it's right there multiplied by one minus R. So this equals zero. So this does telescope. Like I was saying, all but a finite number of terms, like two or three. I mean, it's already finite, but enough go away that what's left is just super simple, okay? Because if, if, if this had a million terms in it, it would still go away and we just left with these two, okay? That's the elegance of this procedure. And this has been known for, for many, many years. Um, and and we, we're just like, we, we're like, okay, we're happy because we can use this to now realize a partial sum formula for the geometric sequence. So now, now that this is gone, we're just left with these two terms. So now equivalently, you'll be glad in, in calculus one when you get telescoping sums, that means you'll be able to complete the problem. So we have one minus R. And now of course we have an A minus an A R N, we can factor the A from that, A one minus R to the N. So now we just, we're down to nothing. And of course, we're assuming R does not equal one. So we can divide by one minus R. So we get A times one minus R to the N. You can put a little dot there, use parentheses, it, it, your choice, one minus R. So you're thinking, wow, let's, let's just compare. For the arithmetic, we had something like this. Not completely simple, but you know, we can remember it on a good day, put it on your note card. Now, when you look at this, you're like, okay, that's not so bad either. You know, gotta get used to it. But for the partial sum, we have A times the fraction one minus R to the N, we're in, you see, we're in the, see, and, and now we're like, oh, oh, look at this, look at this, let's, let's finish the story. What does this actually equal? Let's write it down. K equal, this is our, this is kind of like our little uh, uh, formula chart to N, A R K minus one. We'll just tack on what it actually is. So A times one minus R to the N divided by, divided by one minus R is actually this sum right here, notated this way. So if, if we're gonna work with the geometric sequence and we wanna use this sum, then we're gonna to have to make the sum look like that. I mean, the sum will need to look like this if we're gonna use this formula or we have to rig it in a way so that we know what A is and we know what R is and we know what N is because without all of that, so the geometric is more complicated than the arithmetic just because of the multiplication property. So when we use this formula, this is like A plus AR plus AR squared up to ARN minus one. That's what this is. And the sum is right here. So we see the N if we got these indices and this nth term, the n is right here, a r blueprint. But again, don't fall into the pit by just saying, oh, well, you know, is it an ellipse or a hyperbola? There's a big difference, okay? You have a major axis and you have a transverse axis, okay? You, you, in one case, you have what slant asymptotes, in the other case, you don't. Okay, so, so the thing is, the convention is important, extremely important. So, so now we look at this and say, okay, so what about that infinite case you were talking about? Let's talk about that, then we'll do some examples. So now, one thing you're gonna learn in calculus is the following, and this will be a limit you'll learn in calculus. That is, if the absolute value of R is less than one, this implies that the limit 
as n passes to infinity of r sub n is actually zero. You'll be able to prove that. Right now, you just have to kind of look at it intuitively. That as you raise uh, numbers to larger and larger integer powers that are between negative one and one, the, the numbers get closer and closer to zero. Now, of course, that's not a proof, but the intuition is, is, is really compelling. And so when you look at this and you think, okay, well, hmm, that makes sense. So if this is the case, then we can now say, if we have, now I could just use n instead of k, I don't have to worry about the n's gonna go to infinity, n equals one to infinity of a r n minus one. Again, the, the, there's no n, so I can use n, you can use k if you like. This will just be a divided by one minus r. Because now, the r to the n converges to zero, and you're just left with that, which is a divided by one minus r. So in the infinite case, the infinite case, if you have the common ratio satisfying this restriction, and this is something you'll say more about in calculus too, uh, you'll, you'll repeat all of this, and, and hopefully you won't forget everything I've told you and, and, and not be starting at square one. So, when you look at this, ladies and gentlemen, we have the luxury of having the finite sum, the partial sum, and we also have the added benefit that if the common ratio satisfies this restriction, then the sum converges in the infinite case. And this is why this is so important in calculus and physics and engineering. I mean, even in complex analysis, the geometric series is of utmost importance. So this is where we get, this is where we say converges, converges in the infinite case. It always converges in the finite case. I mean, if you add a finite set of numbers, the, the result is finite. I don't care if you have a billion numbers or two numbers, okay? It's still finite. Um, infinite case it is, is, is of huge importance and that's where calculus is so important and the the discovery and invention of calculus changed the way we look at the world and has changed our technology. So when we look at this, we think, okay, how can we apply this? So let me just do an example here. Here's a good example of uh, computing a partial sum. So let's look at this. So example. So I'll say compute, and this is where you get to use, like I say, Depending on what the hypothesis is, you can string everything together and figure out the sequence uh, with the given uh, terms. Like for instance, when you're doing the conic sections and they give you bits and pieces about the conic section and it allows you to write the equation for it, this is the same thing. So in this case, compute the partial sum. Now this one's given in, in the uh, standard form, not in the sum form. So let's look at it. This is one minus one half. This is what I was talking about before, but now we're seeing that the R is different from just one half. We'll talk about it. Plus minus. And the ending term is this. So when you look at this, you look at this example, you're thinking, okay, well, this is not written with the summation form. So we gotta, we gotta check it out a little bit, but we can, we can figure everything out that we need. First, the first term here is one. So we can already say that A equals one. And then of course, to move from one to negative one half, we have to multiply by negative one half. And that clearly says if we go from negative one half to one fourth, we multiply by negative one half. So here we see that R equals negative one half. So this gives us a blueprint for everything, at least in terms of the A and the R. And now it's like, well, this is a partial sum. So now we know what? We know A sub N equals a r to the n minus one. So we can fill everything in. So this is going to be what, well, one is one. So we just leave that out. So we get what negative one half 
to the n minus one. So when we look at that, we're thinking, okay, well, that's good. So that's the general term. And now let's, let's operate on this, 512. 512, well, let's just, that's what, two times 256. These are easy numbers. And then of course we can break this up. This is two times two times 128. Just breaking it down to some manageable numbers. Two times two times two times 64. Just going down to some small numbers that are easy. Two times two times two times two times 32. So now we know 32 is just two to the fifth. And of course you probably already knew this. But when we look at this, we get two to the fourth times two to the fifth or two to the ninth. So now this implies that negative one over 512 equals negative one half to the ninth. So when you look at this analysis here, this, this is kind of what you have to do because you're not given the sum. This is a harder problem, okay? Because if you were given the sum that looks like this, then you're good to go. If the sum is this, or you can rig it so it looks like this, you get your N, you get your A and your R, boom, okay? That's a, that's a luxury. But in the real world, Lots of times we'll get series that look like this where we have to dissect them a little bit. So now, now we can say, all right, well, let's just go ahead and, and look at this. If we take this up here, this equals negative one half to the ninth. Now we've got common bases. So we're using the one-to-one -one property of exponentials. So this implies when from this analysis and this analysis, that n minus one equals nine. Of course, if we add one, n equals 10. So now, not only are we ready to do this problem, we know that we're doing the 10th partial sum. So we have a is one, r is negative one half, and n is 10, so we're ready to go. So, so again, when we think about this, if this had been written correctly, the upper limit would have been 10, and we could have said, oh, we're good to go. We know what A is, we know what R is, we're, we're done. But it wasn't written that way, so we had to figure out the 10 using this analysis and then comparing the two uh, exponential equations or exponential terms. So now this implies that S10, so we've got A, which is one, and then we have one minus negative one half to the 10th. And then we get one minus negative one half. So let me just write over to the side what I just wrote. This is A times one minus R to the N, one minus R. So geometric, geometric is more complex but not a lot. It's just that we've now got to deal with products, which usually are simpler, but you know, we have to do a little bit more analysis. So now let's figure out what this is. So notice the, the positive, the even here is going to absorb that. So this is going to be one minus one over two to the 10. And of course we, you know, luxury here. Uh, we already know that two to the 10 is just what two times that, which is 1,024. So from doing this analysis, we know what that equals. And then of course, we've got one plus a one half. So now what do we have? So we've got two to the 10th, which is 1,024. So we have 1,024 minus one. And of course, this is just three halves. So let me just put the line here. So this will give us two thirds. And now of course we've got 1,024. And here we have what, 1,023. 
So one thing about the uh, geometric is that we definitely are going to encounter much more uh, complex arithmetic because of the ratios that we don't have with the arithmetic, but that's okay. It, we got to pay the price because this is such an important result and, and the price is worth it. So now, of course, the two will absorb here. That'll give us a 512. So we've got three times 512. That was easy. And of course, the sum of these is uh, uh, six. So that'll three divides it. So we got three. So that'll be what a three and then a four and then a one. So of course the threes absorb. And this gives us 341 divided by 512. So, so with the geometric, we, we navigate the waters just like we do arithmetic. We've got to know A, D and N for arithmetic. For geometric, we need A, R, N. But we may have to work a little bit harder. But when I say we have to work harder, you might have a problem with arithmetic that requires more work. I mean, it just depends on what you're given. So just remember, <clears throat> if you're not given a partial sum in terms of the sigma here, then you've got, to, you've got to go about finding the n in a different way. But again, you've got this blueprint when you can use it. <clears throat> so again, just remember <clears throat> when it comes to working with, with series, it's kind of like we got all of our ducks in a row. We've got the unit circle working with trig. We, we respect the arithmetic of the unit circle. Okay, with the sequences, we have to respect the form. OK, when you work with identities, you know, you, you know, as long as you're consistent between what the arguments are, do you go A to the double angle? Do You go A to the half angle. I mean, you have to be consistent. You can start with any angle you want, just so long as you're consistent in applying what you have. So once you set up the convention, you respect it. And so we're seeing that our convention for the geometric is really nice. And of course, as you take more math, you'll make some subtle adjustments here to, to make your life a little bit easier because <clears throat> it may turn out that with a re-indexing, you can write the series in a way that's beneficial for maybe power series. So when you get the power series in calculus two, uh, you'll be using the geometric as a means to create new power series through partial fraction decomposition, through term-by-term -term integration and term-by-term -term integrate uh, differentiation. So it, there's going to be so many opportunities to use a geometric. Now, I wanted to look at an example. Where is it where we have a uh, fraction or a repeating decimal? So a lot of times, students need extra practice with working with um, repeating decimals. So I just want to give you a very simple exercise here about that. And we'll, we'll do a simple one. So often, often you, you in your number theory, your general math class, you'll see an example where they say, write the repeating decimal as a fraction. And of course, you can. There, there are other tricks and things to use to do this. But I want to, I want to showcase this problem in terms of a uh, geometric sequence. <clears throat> so here we go. So look at the following. So say I'll just say right. We'll say point one, two, five, repeating as a fraction. of integers. Now this is easy, but I want to show you that this is actually geometric. Okay, so now when you look at this, this is one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, five, one, two, five. So let's write it down. So this will be point one, two, five. So we can think of one, two, five, divided by 10 to the third. And then we're going to move three decimals down to the next one, two, five. 
one, two, five, 10 to the sixth. To again, to move everything down three more decimals. Keep going. One, two, five, 10 to the ninth. Write one more, one, two, five, 10 to the 12th, et cetera. So basically when you, when you characterize a repeating decimal this way, you're seeing that it is actually a fraction. That is, this is 0.125 and this is 0 0.000125 and this is 0 0.000000125, et cetera. So this is just moving the unit one, two, five down three more decimals, down three more decimals, down three more decimals. So when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, let's set this up in terms of uh, geometric. So now, and, and this is where you have complete flexibility. You can say, okay, well, there's my, right there, there's my first term. And then to get from this term to this term, I multiply by one over a thousand or one over 10 uh, to the third power. So we can characterize this, if you like, as, and this is, this is completely up to you. This is not unique whatsoever. We can say N equals one to infinity. We'll say 125 over 1,000, and then we'll have one over 1,000, n minus one. So this is the infinite series. And this is using, I keep, let's see here. Where did I put that last one? Maybe covered it up. Well, here we go. Choosing this one right here. Okay. So when we compare, we have the A, we have the R, the N minus one, and then of course the N has been replaced with infinity as the upper limit. So this is the infinite series. And over here, let me write this in red. A equals 125 over 1,000. It just depends how you characterize it. It doesn't matter any choice of Manipulation is fine as long as it's legal. R is one over a thousand. And N passed to infinity, right? Okay, so this is the infinite. And I did an easy one where we didn't have extra numbers hanging out so you can easily see this. And then you can uh, graduate to more complicated things where you got non-repeating parts that you just kind of move over to the side. You compute this and then add them in and then you're done. So infinite geometric series. Now, of course, there are other mechanisms to do this, but I wanted to show it this way so you can actually see that this is indeed geometric. So now let's write our formula here. N equals one to infinity. This will be A over one minus R. So now we've got A so this is 125 over 1,000. And then downstairs, we have one minus R. So one minus one over 1,000. So we get 125 over 1,000. And downstairs, we have 1,000. And so this would just be what? 1,000 minus one. So this gives us 125. Now, of course, the thousands absorb. I'll, I'll just write it two ways. These absorb clearly, but let me write it so you can see that more clearly here. Now, of course, if you look here, the, uh, the sum here is eight, so that's not divisible by uh, three. So these absorb, again, if you look at it in this light. So, 
So now, and, and this is not a surprise. This is absolutely no surprise to you. That is repeating decimals are algebraic in the sense that, you know, you think about numbers like pi and e and the square root of two. The square root of two is still algebraic. However, things like pi, they, 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 they are even on a higher level. They don't, they don't do this. The square root of two does not do this. But any repeating decimal can be written as the ratio of two integers. And that's a, that's a very fascinating fact. It's kind of like at the beginning of the class, I said the natural numbers are well-ordered. Why are they well-ordered? Because every subset of natural numbers has a least element. But that's not true for real numbers. And you know it's not true. What if you have the subset 0 to 1 where the uh, 0 and 1 are not part of the set? Well, there is no smallest real number greater than 0. So the luxury that we, we enjoy when we talk about sequences at least with the natural numbers, is kind of lost as we move to real numbers. But we, of course, gain so many continuum properties for real numbers that we are OK with it. So when it comes to working with decimals, it's not difficult as, for instance, if you're dealing with uh, repeating. Now, again, there are other techniques to do this. And you may have seen them. And that's fine. But I want you to practice this. I want you to practice this technique here of characterizing the repeating decimal as a uh, ratio of two integers and characterizing it as an infinite geometric series, because that's one other opportunity to, to uh, capitalize on this. Now, I want to just set up an example that I will finish next time, but let me get it started. This is just a nice application uh, in, your, in your homework. And we'll get it started and then I'll complete it. So example, I thought it was nice, uh, a nice example. So it says a ball <clears throat> is dropped from a height of nine feet. The ball always bounces up one third, one third of the distance it has fallen. And here's the first part A. Compute the distance. So you're thinking this is this is geometric, one third, one third, one third. You know you, that you're kind of like, oh, well, that's a giveaway. Compute the distance traveled by the ball at the instant. At the instant it hits the ground, the fifth time, and of course this can be generalized clearly. But what's nice about this problem is that you can actually generalize it easily if you set this part up right. I mean, you can do problems in a piecemeal fashion. And so I'm just going to set it up and we'll finish this next time as a, 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 a icebreaker for uh, the next lecture. But here's what I want you to do. And you can think about this ahead of time. And you can fill in some details, but I'll, I'm, I'm about out of time. But I'll, I'll go ahead and set this up. Do a little diagram. So you've got the ball and it hits the ground. And you've got nine feet here. So you hit the ground right here. Then second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, something like that. OK, a diagram is really nice. It helps you to organize. So here's what I want you to do. 
think about this. Here's the first. So we just say first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So what I've done here is I've just notated when it hits the ground. So of course, we, you know, when you think about this, and this is what I want you to consider, here's the distance here. I mean, if you, if you, if you were like a doing calculus, which would be even harder to do, you're thinking, okay, how do we, how do we do the distance? We're not actually doing the arc length, but we've got this distance. But as we go here, we've got the distance up and distance down. Distance up, distance down, distance up, distance down, distance up, distance down to the fifth impact. So what I want you to do is think about how you would actually compute these distances, at least up using the given information and then sum it by noticing possibly that you've got a geometric progression in this. So the key is this, not only are we interested in how high the ball goes, but then we have to keep track of the distance back. So this, this gives a diagram of the actual path of the ball, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't, we're not actually computing the distance or the length of this curve. That's what you do in calculus. So when we think about this, we're thinking, how can you take this diagram and figure out? So here's what I want you to think, just like I've done here distance, 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 distance. I think this is a nifty little problem. And when you generalize it, if you set this up very carefully, then you have a rubric, you have a blueprint to generalize using the formulas that I've already given you. So I want you to think about this. Now, of course, if you're busy getting your homework done, you may not have much time to think about it. It's a beautiful problem, but I will, I will finish this uh, at our next lecture and then we'll do some review examples. But I hope, I hope that you see that as we complete the course, we're, we're covering ideas that kind of just pull in disparate topics. With sequences, it's like, hmm, I got done sequences in college algebra. Yeah, you could have, but you're at a higher level now. So you can understand what I'm talking about. So we're pulling in all these concepts that you may have spoken about in your number theory type general math class. And now we're giving them a little bit more foundation. So what we'll do after this is we're gonna take those famous formulas and we're gonna talk about mathematical induction. So we've got these series based upon sequences, partial sums, how interesting. And then we're gonna look at proving logical facts about natural numbers with induction. And then from induction, so we'll pull in some of the famous formulas. And then we're gonna think about how can we extend the binomial theorem based upon what we've already talked about in this class and give you some ways to deal with binomial coefficients and some computational details that you'll use in calculus. Because when you get to calculus two, you will do the binomial theorem in the more generalized case where the powers are actually fractions. So then you're gonna learn about how your uh, calculator works. So what's so nice about calculus two is that it introduces the concept of the series and the Taylor polynomial which gives rise to the way the computers that we use actually calculate values for logarithms, trig functions, algebraic functions. It's not magic, it's just arithmetic. So I hope you've enjoyed this. This is always fun. And I say everything about math is fun, but I'm clearly biased. But uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, I'll complete this and then we'll talk about uh, some review examples. So I wish you well as you study. And again, I appreciate your attendance today. Again, it's not, not too much longer. And just remember, I sent out the email about the uh, signature assignment. Again, it's a very straightforward problem using the law of cosines, you'll enjoy it. You'll submit that online and that'll just be an extra quiz grade, okay? So, so don't forget about that. I've given you plenty of time to think about it and it's like, you know, you've got a million things to do, I know, but this will give you an opportunity for an additional quiz grade. And again, 
keep the college happy because we have to keep track of your critical thinking skills, but you're taking a math class, so you're pretty good at critical thinking. But everybody have a great day. Good luck as you're studying. And again, thanks for your attendance today.